Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Burns, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is a commission's weekly online event where we cover any library topics that may be of interest to librarians, Nebraska librarians across the state. Um, we do these sessions every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time live. Um, they last about an hour, give or take, depending on what we have to talk about. Um, and we have a whole mixture of things, presentations, interviews, um, little mini training sessions, um, whatever we can come up with that we think may be of interest to you guys. Uh, we bring in guest speakers sometimes, and sometimes we have our own commission staff, which is what we have today. Um, this is, next, sitting next to me today is Michael Sowers, who is the Technology Innovation Librarian here at the Library Commission. And he does a monthly show, bit, episode, episode. Bit, well, <laughs> bit works, episode, episode works too. Of um, Encompass Live once a month, he does his Tech Talk, where he talks about anything interesting that's come up in the past month, interesting, mm -hmm. useful about technology. Um, Get a little so. geekier. Yeah, a little geekier for the geeky people out there. Um, but we do, you know, well, you don't have to be geeky to listen to him. <laughs> I can make it. And you, can, and you can be geeky and listen to her. I can make, I can, I can uh, translate <laughs> for him. Well, in the other episodes. Yes. Some yes. other episodes are technology related, but. This, this is, is true. This is, yes, this is true. One. Some of our other regular sessions are just whatever the topic happens to be, but we always have a monthly one. So if uh -huh. that's your kind of thing that you're interested in, that you do at your library, you know, check in once a month. Michael will be here yeah. always doing this. Um, so I will... Right. And, and I will pick it up from there. Or, uh, what you're doing today. Okay. And regular listeners will know that typically I try to... Um, uh, bring in guest speakers for my sessions, people to interview. We've had uh, Tim Spaulding from uh, Library Thing. We've had Bobby Newbin from Chattanooga, right? Yes. Um, we've had people from, from all over talking about different topics, iPads and Google uh, laptops and all sorts of other things. And um, those interviews have been going so well, usually at the end of each one of those episodes, I try to spend you know, plan on 15 minutes of news and updates and things. Uh, and the problem is, is I've, they, they, those have gone so well, I usually end up with five minutes. <laughs> you run out uh, of time. I run out of time to kind of cover the news and things. So what I'm kind of doing this month is not having uh, an interview, mainly because a lot of the people I would have asked were at ALA. This is true. Uh, <laughs> and and they're, they're, they're just coming back yesterday or today. But um, I just had lots of odds and ends, and a lot of news has happened. So uh, things that I think we ought to talk about, cover, um, and just deal with some of the issues that have been kind of outstanding. So as usual, I have a whole bunch of bookmarks. And we, you'll see the URL up there. We will link to it with the recording, all of mm -hmm. those other things. You don't need to write down all no. of these individual URLs. Um, we'll just go from there. And in fact, um, these are the copies of uh, the bookmarks in my Delicious account. We will be transferring them over the, to the Commission's Delicious yes. account so that they'll actually be available in two places mm -hmm. uh, once the recording is up probably tomorrow. So, what is the first big topic that I want to talk about today? Unfortunately, if you know me at all, if you've been listening to me for the last two years, the one topic that they keeps coming up over and over again is passwords. Oh. Passwords, yes. Okay. You, you, <laughs> you hate that I talk about it or you, no. you hate passwords? and, and Having you know, to change, change passwords. passwords. Yes, well, guess what? Pick a new one because um, somebody had to go and break into something. Probably going to make you change your password again, but through the things that I watch and the people I listen to, I might have a better way for you to create a really strong password without too much trouble remembering it. Okay. That's so no first, yes, okay, so first we're going to talk about why uh, I'm having this conversation yet again, um, and then we'll talk about what, what kind of the new, new methodology for creating passwords is. So the first one is this wonderful website called shouldichangemypassword.com. Uh, I don't know how much, uh, how many of you in the audience have been paying attention to security news over the last month or so, but a whole bunch of websites in the last couple of months have been compromised, starting with Sony mm -hmm. being the big one, uh, the Sony PlayStation Network, and a whole bunch of other websites that, I, it, 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 at this point, it doesn't matter because if you think 
that you didn't have an account on one of these sites, chances are you might actually have done you have. Um, and and what just didn't realize what that it was linked to that. Yeah, PlayStation. or you know, I think I signed up with the PlayStation Network when I got my PS2 like ten years ago, ah. and okay. I've never used it, and I've completely oh, forgotten it. about it. Oh, we we can we, can, have a we, we can try. Okay, so anyways, oh, what this site does is it actually got all the databases, copies of all the databases that everybody uh, that that got released and will tell you whether or not your email address was included in any one of these databases that was hacked. Mm. So what I did was I kind of came here a couple weeks ago and I put in my email address and I said check it. Now bulk check will allow you to put in multiple mm. email addresses and oh. um, here we go my email username and password have been compromised at least one time. The most recent recorded occurrence was December 12, 2010. So in other words, my password, my username, or this email address along with the matching password was in at least one of those databases that has been compromised. Hmm. Okay, do we want to try your, uh, um, what email address well, for Krista we'll try? Um, do you want to do this for the benefit of the recording or no? I'm going to try it later. You can try my Gmail on Krista.Burns at Gmail. Okay, it's dot burns. Um, at gmail. Yeah. <laughs> Spell it correctly. I can't talk and type I at the same time. Oh, oh no. Nope. You're good. Now, awesome. it okay. looks like your passwords may be safe. It was yeah, not no. in any of the breaches that it knows about. Okay. So, you know, this isn't 100%, but you're generally safe from mm -hmm. these recent incidents. I'm not. Uh, yeah, interesting. Um, now, those now your yes. travelinglibrarian.info email is older than my Gmail address. May that have a maybe? A I mean, if 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 um, I only well, not necessarily email, like a couple of years ago. But if even, if you had used that email address in any of the compromised yeah. sites within the last couple of years, so anyways, uh, you know, this is just if you get the red flag, <laughs> you really want to start changing your passwords. Yeah. Okay? Sure. Now, if um, if people have listened to me before about passwords, I, I've given several strategies, and one of those strategies is kind of create kind of this master password using a phrase and do some character replacements and all these other things. And then what I've done, and actually do continue to do, is then um, tweak that password for each and every individual site. Mm -hmm. So for example, I have a base password and then say, for example, add AZ on the end for Amazon, mm -hmm. and might add um, DE on the end for delicious, um, or for Yahoo, add YH on the end. Okay, so I don't use the same password across multiple sites. Okay? Right. That's already good. The problem is, is I, use, I potentially use that strategy in the site that was compromised. Mm -hmm. So if you can look at that and kind of figure out what I had done, you might be able to guess my other passwords on other sites. Because you have a pattern. Because I have yeah. a pattern. Okay, now, patterns are not necessarily bad, but I need to pick a new pattern now because my pattern has been exposed. Okay, so this forced me to start reconsidering passwords. Now, I have not gone through the hundreds and hundreds of sites and changed every single password that I've ever had. Oi, wow, that yeah. would be obnoxious <laughs> um, and time-consuming at, at, at best. But I have changed, like, banking password, Amazon, Google, kind of the major sites where maybe the most damage could be done if somebody mm -hmm. figured out sure, my yeah. password thing. Or you might have some really, really sensitive information yes, behind like that banking. password. Yeah. Yes. And in fact, uh, the banking password doesn't even use my same strategy. I, I, you know, I have a different strategy for that one because it's super Smart. sensitive. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. Now let's get into the kind of new strategy for creating a password. And the general strategy still theoretically applies. Okay. Such as think of a phrase, pick the first letter from each of those phrases, and then maybe start substituting numbers for letters, symbols for things like this. Okay. Now this is where though things get a little more complicated, so bear with me just a little bit. Okay. For example, and Chris I'll have you look at this, let's say that um, my password is that. Okay. Yeah. Would you consider that a good password? 
Yes. Okay, yes. Okay, good. Good answer. Because it's got uppercase, lowercase, no real words, special characters. Okay, yeah. So it's... But it's you, impossible to remember. Well, uh -huh, right, okay. So it's bad because so, it's a randomly generated... Right, okay, yeah. yeah. You can do this. And so <laughs> basically a good password will be, will include letters, uppercase and lowercase, numbers and symbols. Okay, which this one does. Okay, we got some lowercase, we got some uppercase, we got some numbers, we got some symbols in there. Okay, and longer is better. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so on my whole Wi Fi network, this is great. I had a 64 character completely random password. That's insane. Which, when I first created it, was it super secure, mm -hmm. okay, completely unmemorable, but I did have it written down in a secure location. And if somebody brought in their laptop, I'd plug in my flash drive. And I would copy and paste the Wi-Fi password into their computer, and off you go. That's really not necessary, right? You just did that. For I, fun. It was a little extreme. <laughs> okay, it was a little extreme. I kind of did it to prove a point, but it, it, but but it follow all it follows all the rules completely random. It has mm -hmm. a lot of what's called entropy. In other words, there's a lot of randomness in it. Yeah. Okay. And that's what you want to do to fight these people. Right. There. And that's yeah. what you want to do for a super super secure password in general. Okay. Now. The problem came like trying to type that into um, iPods oh. um, and typing it into little tablet machines where I can't plug in a flash drive and do copy and paste. Mm. And that got, to be, that got to be kind of painful. I did it, and a couple times I had to type it in more than once because I got a character wrong somewhere in the middle of the 64. <clears throat> but um, somebody I mentioned before, Steve Gibson from GRC Corporation or Gibson Research Corporation, is very big in security, does a podcast called Security Now, really put in a lot of thought to this. And what, basically what he said was, is that password that I just typed in there, and in fact, I will make our lives a little easier here, and I forgot to do this before. We'll kind of make it a little bigger. Okay. What he said was maybe something like this. Let me see. Let me let me come up with something and um, see if you think this is more or less secure. So uh, I'm going to do an N, an L, and a C. Okay, now that's a lowercase L there, by the way. Um, and then I'm going to say something like, um, you know, L. Uh, uh, see, I didn't I didn't plan this out good enough here. So uh, N L C. Um, and we're going to say something like. Um, Pound exclamation point there, and then ten periods. Okay. <clears throat> How good is that password? Good password, bad password. What do you think? Ten periods. Why? Well, I have no idea. There's no numbers in it. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. And then because I did ten periods, I'll add the, the number ten. On there. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. How's that? What do you think? Yeah, I can't imagine anyone would guess that. Okay. But Compare the two passwords on the screen. Which one do you think is better? I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, here's the fun part. is actually, with, without actually counting, okay, the second password is actually just as good, almost as good as the first one. Because of the 10 periods. Okay. Well, here's the key. Because you are using capitals and lowercase. You're doing all the rules. That yep, and, and symbols and numbers. But the, the previous thought was is that you want that entropy, you want that randomness. Well, you can put in 10 of the exact same thing as long as it's long and is using kind of all four categories, it's, just as, it's, it's almost just as good. Okay? So, for example, what I'm going to do here is I'm going I'm to chop this one down just a little bit here. And I'm going to take this one, I'm going to copy that, and I'm going to put it into a, another site I've linked to called Password Haystacks. And this is from GRC. And I'm going to paste that in. It's going to do a little test here. And this said that it is 18 characters long. I've got seven uppercase, seven lowercase, two digits, and two symbols. So I've got four green lights across the top there. And basically, um, we're looking at worst case scenario, it might take um, 1.200 uh, or 1.28 trillion uh, centuries. To crack oh, this, this. Is, oh, I like that. Okay, it's that like sort of thing, right? Like, I found out okay. it'll take this long to crack but, my password. But how how memorable is that? Yeah, it's not. It's not very. Memorable. Okay, so let's take this one, and so I've kind of created NLC and a couple of symbols, ten periods, and then the number ten at the end because I had ten periods. Okay, so a little more memorable. Okay, I'm going to paste that in, and um, again, I've done all four 
uh, whatever, uh, categories there. Um, this one's 17 characters long instead of 18. And best case or worst case scenario, it might take 13.44 billion centuries. Instead of a trillion, it might take a couple billion. <laughs> okay. Okay. The point being is not necessarily randomness. Randomness is not as important as we thought it was in passwords. It's length mm. with the ability to have things in all four of those categories. Mm -hmm. Because you know, think about how, um, um, you ever watch a movie where they're cracking a password? Yeah. They're breaking into something and they get the first letter or number and then they get the next one, one and, the and then they get one. the third one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't this work is that way. <laughs> it, it, it is completely Hollywood. You type in the password, it's either right or it's wrong. It doesn't tell you which character is wrong. It's not that game Mastermind. Remember game Mastermind? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Well, it colored pegs, and you had to guess the pattern that the person had created. But at each step, the person would tell you if they were, if you had like right color, wrong position, or wrong wrong color. And anyways, com computer passwords don't work that way. So the idea is that you can create a memorable password that is as complex as it needs to be to be theoretically unbreakable. Okay. So what I've done is I've created, I took my old pattern, made a new pattern with more symbols and numbers stuck in, right? and then I've padded the end of it with a bunch of extra stuff, like, for example, in this case, the padding would be my 10 periods. Right? I could take those 10 periods and maybe do something like N1C, okay, and then something like that, okay? It's memorable. It uses uppercase, it loses number case, it uses a digit, and it uses symbols. But it's something that I could probably remember. Yeah. And best, worst case scenario, you're looking at 1.49 million centuries to break this. <laughs> right. I feel safe. Yeah, you're feeling a little better? So, you know, if you've got bad passwords, I would say change your passwords. I would definitely go into this, should I change my password? And if you get a red result, yeah, start changing passwords. And then come up with a new method. Make sure you use all four categories, uppercase, lowercase, digits, and symbols. And then you know what? Pat it on the end. Make it longer. Just with some extra. And making it longer doesn't have to be unmemorable. Make it, you know, memorable like that. Make it memorable, I mean, just, you know, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay? 1.6500 centuries. Okay? Cool. So, random is not necessarily important as length and using the four types. That's really what it boils down to. Any questions coming in on this? <laughs> no? Okay. Um... Now, if you want, there is an episode of Security Now, which is a uh, weekly podcast hosted by Leo Laporte and Steve Gibson. Um, and look up the episode. It's from about a month ago called Password Haystacks. And he explains this over about 45 minutes. <laughs> and he actually gets into the math. Nah, and, and yeah, we don't yeah, exactly. So, and, and actually, this webpage also continues on way down here and explains what all this is and gives a much more detailed account. If you really just, care to go that Yeah, way. if you really care. It's interesting. I am not a math whiz by any stretch of the imagination, but I understood what he's saying here. So that's, um, you know, math major, I was not. <laughs> no. no. Yeah, it took me two years to get through trigonometry, so and I've forgotten all of it since. So this is just algebra. Oops, I'm hitting the wrong buttons. Okay, so that really is my bit about passwords. Mm -hmm. Okay, I promise I will try to not talk about passwords as much in the future, but you know things happen, and I want you all to know about it. Be aware. Okay. So back to my list, and this does, some of this is really, really random, but let's kind of stick with the security-related things for, for a few more minutes um, before we, we go any further. Um, and this first one here, uh, you've heard me talk about this before. 
um, and that is logging into websites using SSL or the HTTPS mm -hmm. as opposed to HTTP. Um, the big time I really started bringing this up was when that Firesheet program yeah. came out and was allowing people to, to log into your Facebook account on your behalf. Um, you can now set up Google so that it always logs in as a secure connection. And what you do is instead of going to google.com, you go to https colon slash slash encrypted.google.com. Okay. Uh, so you kind of set that up as, say, maybe your home page in your browser or something like that. And when you actually go there, um, you will see that uh, you have this little lock in the Google logo. You will also have an HTTPS connection. And then now if you're on uh, like open Wi-Fi, for example, people cannot sniff on what you're searching uh, for Google. And to which if you know you're kind of a, um, more concerned about patron privacy, make, maybe making this uh, the Google bookmark that you give your patrons on the public machines mm. as opposed to that. And that way, you know, things are not logged, it's encrypted, you can't know what they're searching, that sort of thing. If you don't need the information, why have the information? Yeah. Um, so uh, that is now available to you. And then from here, you can always go to the classic Google, which is the open, unencrypted, plain connection. So just an article about that, something you might want to consider. It also talks about the benefits of doing this. Um, in a little more detail than I just talked about myself. And then I had one other security issue here, and that is a little plugin called Ghostery. Ghostery. Now, this one gets a little more complicated. Um, and what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to install this into Firefox. And in Firefox, it's a plugin, um, also available for Safari and Chrome and Internet Explorer. Um, so all the major browsers do have this available. And I may, maybe should have uh, done this in advance, but I didn't. So we're all going to see an actual real-life example <laughs> of installing a Firefox plugin because I think what it's going to do is make me restart my browser yeah. uh, to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and install that now. Or I'm going to try to... As my browser crashes. Yeah. Please do not crash on me. There we go. Okay, restart now. Give me just a second here. Just in case this doesn't come back up, I am going to now restart my browser. Now we get back to my bookmarks. This is the pause that refreshes <laughs> as we refresh the browser and drink some more coffee. And wait for Firefox to load. There, there we go. Goes. Okay, so let's go back to my bookmarks here. Um, now, one of the things I need to do is I need to make uh, Ghostery show up. So I'm going to customize this. And it gives me now a little... Um, where is it? Not cool. Oh, boy. Welcome to live demonstration. <laughs> Allow, downloading add-on, install now, restart Firefox. We're going to try to, if it doesn't work this time, we're moving on. That's fine. Okay. That's what Ghostery does is it's a little plugin that keeps track of what's tracking you online. Okay. okay. So, for example, just cookies, mm -hmm. Google Analytics, um, little uh, things that track advertising. Is what's coming up. There are hundreds upon hundreds of these things going on behind the scenes. And what Ghostry is going to do is it's going to alert you whenever you go to a website which one is being used. And here we go. This is what I'm supposed to see when we started up there. Okay, so I'm going to get started. And um, the first thing I can do is I can turn on the ability to kind of report back to the Ghostry system what, what I'm allowing or not allowing. So we're going to go ahead and do that. Okay. And then, do I want to be alerted whenever it finds something? So, yes, let's do that. Uh, and then, do you want its library of tracking things to be auto-updated? Yes, please, let's do that. And then, do I want to enable the ability to block certain tracking things? Okay, so by default, it just notifies you of things. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on blocking here. And by default, I can say, please block 
550 something different things or I can turn them on a, on a case by case basis. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to block everything. Okay, because I really want to protect my privacy here. Mm -hmm. And it says, okay, you're done. Thank you very much. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to customize my toolbar here so that I get my little ghost to show up. Like, there's my ghost. All right, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to reload, let's say, my delicious page here. And what should happen is it tells me that I'm not being tracked at all. Nothing happened with my little ghost. Instead, let's go to msn.com. Now, I'm not picking on MSN. It was just the first thing that popped into my head. And right there, there's something popped up. And notice that list is getting longer. OK. And so now this website is tracking me via DoubleClick, Microsoft Analytics, Microsoft Atlas, uh, Net Ratings, Site Census, oh, I can bring this back up here, uh, and Wall Street On Demand. Huh. And so you know what, out of analytics, um, it's blocking everything by default because told I told it to. Yeah. Well, I can say, well, you know, don't block Microsoft Analytics. Let's let that through. Okay. Um, let me just give you another example. So I'm not just picking on Microsoft here. Okay. And what Google, right off the top, didn't have anything. Okay. But if I was to go to Google Reader, which I believe does use it, okay, there's two of them. They're using the Google Analytics and the Google Website Optimizer. Now, a lot of websites, including my own, uses Google you Analytics. Keep statistics to kind of, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And That's so a very now. Thing. You see lots of libraries actually discussing mm -hmm. that about how they're using it. The libraries or the institution that the library is in is actually using that as their main um, way of tracking right. statistics right. and how their website is being used. Are people using this page? Mm -hmm. Are they not using this page? And why are they? They yep. can, you know. So, so I've installed yeah. this on my own browsers, mm -hmm. but I've unblocked Google Analytics mm -hmm. because you know I don't necessarily mind that people know what browser I'm using and how I'm getting through their website, but I have blocked say double click because that's advertising and I really don't want them tracking me that way. No. Uh, so it's here, it's available. What what I some of the people I've talked to have played around with this is they just turn it on, not blocked, but like let me know what's going on here. You know, little, to just try to get an idea of what's going on behind the scenes with these websites really you give, go to. It'll really give you an idea of for those of us who don't think it's a big deal, yeah, I've heard the stories, read that you're tracked, whatever. Look at all those things that just came up from going to MSN, which you would probably yep. think is just, oh, it's just a site. It's a major, well-known site, but all those things are on it. It may scare you, depending on your point of view. <laughs> yeah. You may be like, oh, well, of course those things are there. Duh. It depends. And it's going to mm -hmm. be your own personal choice on what you're comfortable with. Right. Do you want to block? Do you want to not block? Things like Google Analytics and that was, wasn't the Microsoft Microsoft one? Analytics. Analytics. Would, yeah. Those are things that people use to make their websites better. That's the that information. Mm -hmm. So the kind of thing that you wouldn't have to worry, I would say, to be, you know, for me personally, as a good deed, I'll leave that open so that I can help them make websites sure. better so the Internet's not so crappy anymore. Right. <laughs> but certain things like stuff that's for advertising, yeah, I'm like, mm -hmm. you know what? You don't get to use me for and, that. And you might like, be surprised. <laughs> some, some sites use, you would think a site like Disney would do a lot of tracking. They actually don't do much. Yeah. Um, uh, DoubleClick yeah. and Omniture which are both advertising. Mm -hmm. That's come up so far, but that's about it. Uh, MSN had like half a dozen. Yeah. So, you know, it, like, like Krista said, I'm not here to tell you you must go do this. Although you can maybe make an argument that on public machines, maybe you don't want this tracking to happen. Yeah. I don't know. An it's yeah. an argument to be made. The counter argument might be, though, that letting the tracking happen on public machines is really interesting because the tracking assumes it's one person on a computer. Yeah. And imagine what sort of randomness will come out of a public <laughs> machine in a day. It's going to not be very helpful to these people, yeah, you, really. Yeah, you start messing with their numbers. So, yeah. you know, there's just different <laughs> issues to think about. And so um, it's there. It's a plugin. It's available for all the major browsers. It is something that you can uh, consider using. Cool. So speaking of interesting issues for libraries, mm -hmm. have you heard about Pottermore? Yes. 
who hasn't heard about Pottermore right now? Yeah. And I, I Pottermore is the new website about Harry Potter coming out from J.K. Rowling. Yeah. Um, and the it's it's going to be um, user driven. Nobody really knows what that means yet. Nice. They put out a really cool video uh, with with characters coming out of books and very animated. It was it was absolutely wonderful. And the biggest news out of this, however, is you will be able to buy official ebooks mm -hmm. of the Harry Potter books from Pottermore coming this October. Directly big news. Than yes. The usual. Big news. Yeah. Not through Amazon. Not through Barnes and Noble. Directly from J.K. Rowling's website. Okay. That's the super big news. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the back end big news is that these books will be DRM free. Okay. Mm -hmm. No digital rights management. However, I guess, from what I understand, they will be kind of watermarked so that if you bought your copy and you set your copy free out on the internets, they will know it was your copy. Mm. Okay. What got me thinking and so this is just this is just kind of planting a seed in people's brains okay what does what effect if any does this have on libraries can a library buy a digital copy of harry potter from pottermore and loan it to their patrons I don't know. What are the, the terms of service? We don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> the same issue with um, Amazon and the Kindles. Yep. The terms of service sort of said something. We're vague. They wouldn't give anyone an answer mm -hmm. when people, when librarians actually ask, can we or can't we? So right. libraries did it anyways to see what happened. Mm -hmm. We need to know what it says in the actual. Yep. Yeah. I. I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. I don't know. This question literally popped into my head this morning. As I was kind of preparing for this, you know, making my coffee, and I saw this direct sales and no DRM, and I went, wait a minute, no DRM. How does that affect libraries? What, you know, where where does that fall into play? I don't know. It's something to start thinking about and some something to start looking at. So I will just kind of, you know, throw that out there. Now, DRM, kind of copyright, Okay, it's going to lead me into my next topic here, and that is 3D printing. Okay. Um, okay. Huh? Krista seems a little confused. <laughs> okay. Oh, the 3D. Well, yeah. Printing. Now, there's. I've got two links on the 3D printing, and one of which is a little further down here, and it is a video that I'm not going to actually bring up and play, um, but it says here, watch Stephen Colbert meet his maker bot doppelgangers. Um, 3D printing is becoming mainstream in that it was even on. Um, uh, Stephen Colbert, okay? Mm -hmm. And what they did was they had a guy bring out what's called a MakerBot. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen a MakerBot, and just think, for the benefit, let me step back and just describe 3D printing for a second. Think inkjet printers, but for physical three-dimensional objects, mm -hmm. okay? You build a machine, and you can get a MakerBot for, I think, 500 bucks, I want one so bad. I've, I've got some income coming. I, I'm thinking about buying one. Okay. You buy some basically thing, streams of plastic that you feed into this. You download a CAD file from one of many websites that are out there. And it will actually melt the plastic or other uh, material. And then print it in very thin layers so it builds something mm -hmm. in three dimensions. And so I've seen a video, this, this what is a 12 year old who printed like a new keychain for his mom because he broke it. I mean, that, that was a cool <laughs> video. Uh, it's a video called Why I Love 3D Printing. You've, you've got to watch it, it's hilarious. Uh, and that, that kid is gonna rule the world someday. He can make a presentation happen. He's like 12. Um, y people are just printing objects, okay? And at this point, I mean, just taking it out, wait till you can print your own custom sneakers. I mean, it's just not quite there yet, but it, it's going to happen. Paper sneakers? Well, no, it's not paper. It's oh, it's plastic. Cast. But cast. there's oh, other cast. materials that are they eventually going to work. I mean, so okay. we're, not, we're not to 3D printing fabric quite yet, but <laughs> it's getting close. Okay. And there have even been some articles written about, you know, maybe libraries should start offering 3D printing. 
we offer printing. This is like Earl Grey hot. Yes. I, well, yeah. It's it's okay. Yeah. It's not quite the the um what's the, the, the thing in Star Trek. I can't remember the name of it now, but it's close. Yeah. Okay. That's just what popped in in my head. Sorry. Where this is starting to get interesting is this article here that I I found the other day, but uh, decided to include today. Is that um, there are copyright issues starting to be raised over 3D printing. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a particular example where, oh, and by the way, look at how much tracking this website does. Notice I've still got this turned Ooh. on here. Yeah. Um, if I scroll on down, well, the basic story behind this one is that there's this object which appears yeah, in the movie Super 8, which I'm about to go see tomorrow night. Um, and so what somebody did was they watched the movie, they went home, and in CAD software created this object and then uploaded it to one of these sites called Shapeways, which is where you can download models, 3D models. Well, Paramount Pictures sent the person who did this a cease and desist letter saying, that is an object that we have the rights to. Mm -hmm. uh, we've sold the rights to another company that is going to be selling replicas of this object, um, and therefore you are not allowed to distribute it. this. Right. So, you know, just, just kind of think out when I say print your own pair of sneakers. Well, what if somebody uploads a 3D model of those Air Jordans and you can print them in your home? You won't need to buy them from You won't need to buy them from Nike. You know, they're not going to like that. They're, you know, yeah. They're going to want mean, to get into that, that if you want to, you have to buy our Yes, our model, model as opposed to their model right. for printing. And by the way, ours is going to cost more and the knockoff isn't going to cost as much. And how legal or illegal will things like that be? Mm -hmm. if, if we think we're having issues over copyright now with words, <laughs> take that into three-dimensional space. Mm. It's going to get really complicated really fast. And many years ago, Cory Doctorow wrote a story called Print Crime, which is about that exact situation, hmm. about being able to print stuff at home and the cops coming after you for doing so. Hmm. So it's technology and copyright. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we get geeky here. Yeah. There you go. So things to think about. All right. Let's just get completely different here at this point. Um, this I found this morning through, I believe, Friend Feed. I unfortunately forgot to note who posted this link. But the New York Public Library has a new collection of historical restaurant menus in New York City. Okay. Really cool. And yeah. you can search it because they have transcribed all of it into searchable data along Ooh. with the images. They need help. Well, they're, yeah. This is why I'm mentioning this one. Over here on the left it says, we're describing them disc by disc so they can be searched by what people were eating back in the day. So big a job, we need your help. So if you got a little spare time, want to help a really cool library project, you yeah, can actually sign up. Starts transcribing it there if you scroll down. Oh, yep. Yeah. It's uh, yeah, it's a link that, that takes you through. And well, why don't we go ahead and click on that? And so you literally can start bringing it up, yeah, start transcribing. One, one says zero dishes, zero dishes so and counting. I'm going to go in there and read 31 that. 31 dishes and counting, zero dishes <laughs> and counting. Now, they, the, they have the two transcribed. They have the ones that are under review. Right. So and they have the completed. So they will yes. verify. Yes. You can't just go in and, you know, monkey wrench it and, <laughs> and start typing in weird yeah. dishes or, or, you know, other things like that. Um, but it will be verified, things like that. So... I, I just think this is a cool project. It's crowdsourcing, it's historical, it's digital archiving, it's mm -hmm. uh, metadata, it's you know all sorts of stuff. Um, and I just thought, you know, I I might, you know, if I got some free time this weekend, I might go take a look. And That's I, pretty I'd, cool. Yeah. I'd like to to contribute. It's it's a neat neat little project. Okay. All right. Um, what else have we got here? Um, I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit in my list. I'm, I'm not going to get to everything. It's already quarter of 10. Look at that. Okay. Google's image search. Let's talk about, speaking of searching things. 
they've added something different to Google Image Search, and we're going to try this out live here. Awesome. Um, if live you go demos to, always work so well. Excuse me? Live demos always live work Live so always, well. always work so well. I know. I have not done this yet. So I played out with it on a completely different computer. Okay. If you go to Google Image Search and you have this little icon in your search bar, this means like it's been turned on for you. Looks like a little camera. Right? Yep, looks like a little camera. That's right. Thank you for reminding me that we also put this out on audio only. Nice. Okay, so if there is an image, if there are a little camera icon in your search box in Google Images, you have access to this. They're kind of rolling it out to everybody eventually, so it, it seems kind of random. Luckily, it's working on this computer, which I didn't test before, and I should have. Yeah. Okay. If you do that, there are a couple things you can do. You can put in the URL of an image, mm -hmm. or you can drag and drop an image. Okay, so here's what we're going to try. Okay, I've gone into my images folder here on my computer, and we have this one here of turtles. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to literally drag and drop the turtles onto that, and it's going to upload the image and do a search based on that image. <laughs> That's okay. awesome. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, I'm just thinking about this guy. Okay, so. I know that you've got Wikipedia article, nationalgeographic.com. Uh huh. Similar images. Okay. Now, yeah, it's pretty much the same one because I'm, I'm 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 pulling off the sample images that came with Windows. I, yeah, I didn't I didn't picture, you know pull off you can a, use one a your picture own of pictures me. or something. Yeah. You could use your own picture. Let's let's try the 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 way. Let's see. Wait, wait, I need to go back up to my search box. And I'm going to pull this kind of off to the side here and hide us from view for a moment. Drag that over and drop it. And I will now close this because we don't want to spend all day on this one. I could spend all day on this And there we go. Now, visually similar images. I'm using images that come with Windows, so you're going to get a lot of repeats. Mm -hmm. okay? But if you have something completely custom, I've seen it done with people. Uh -huh. uh, I uploaded actually an image of me, and it found other pictures of me. Cool. Online. Um, wow, I can spend way too much time playing. Yeah, this this, this <laughs> I, I, I can see that be very useful mm -hmm. too. Yes, you want to know what like I oh, well, lots of people I see this is, um, post pictures up into Flickr or just their friends um, a picture of a plant. Yep. What and they plant say, is this? What the heck is this thing growing in my garden? Uh -huh. That might work. Oh wow. Yeah. Think about that. People coming into your library with the same thing. I've got this thing growing in my garden. I've got oh, You've got, got a picture? To, yeah. Throw it on the scanner. I've got upload this rash on images. my arm. I don't know what it is. You know, whatever. <laughs> sure. Yep. I got this bug bite. I mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. and someone in our group here, Margaret, says, I have plants to ID. <laughs> <laughs> Try it and I report back. It, Margaret. Yeah. Yes, please. Let us know how well it works. This is brand new. Now, you'll notice that it has, um, it's also pulled in the file name of the image. So in this mm -hmm. case, that's how it figured out humping whale. Right. Uh, but it did give me my image size. I can then, I have all my narrow But in, even if there uh, wasn't options. a name of it, if it was just uh -huh. like, you know, 1234.jpg, it would find those visually similar yep. ones, and that would help you ID what exactly. is in your picture. Yep. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, the examples we're giving here include well-identified well-named files mm -hmm. to begin with, um, you know, time allowing, I can yank something from Flickr and drag and drop and whatever. But you get the idea. Uh, but yes. yes, you get the idea. So that there you go. I, I think that's that's pretty neat, and that's a, that's a brand new feature this month um, with Google Images. Um, Google, we'll stick with them for a few more minutes, has also released what's called a Me on the Web tool. Um, basically, this is just kind of a combination of Google Alerts and uh, vanity searching. Uh, but what you can do, and it's a new component of the Google dashboard, which I don't believe I'm logged in. So let me actually go there and it might actually to log me log in. Um, and it's in kind of encouraging people to keep track of how the, they themselves are presented online. Hmm. So give me a sec here to let me log in and I have to use my new password. See if I remembered it, because Google was <laughs> oh, one of the first ones I changed. It, yes, yep. from that first thing we showed, yeah. Um, so, okay, so Google Dashboard, If for those of you who haven't seen it before, is basically a way to find all of the information that Google knows about you, especially if you have Google accounts. Okay, and This new area here is me on the web, and it's pulling in links, and then really what you can do here is set up search alerts for your data. 
Um, and then it talks about how to manage your online identity, how to remove additional content, and about me on the web. And it uses the Google Alerts to um, search on your name and the links that it knows about you and all this other information that you provided to Google and then alert you when no new information shows up. So this has kind of existed in other forms but it's Google trying to say a lot of enough people are doing this we're going to create a tool that does this a little more of an automated process. And the reason I wanted to talk about this one is this week's thing in 23 things for professional development is on your oh, online persona yes. and managing yes. it. And one of the assignments is to do a Google search on you to see what comes up. This is a way where you can automate that process. Cool. Yep. So. Nice step there. Yep. Yeah. Hey, you see, you know, tying it all together. <laughs> huh? All right. Um, and then this I'm only going to mention because it pretty much happened, I think, yesterday. Um, and this is Google Plus. Oh, yeah. This is Google's social network that they are doing. It is invite only at the moment. Uh, I have did this keep me posted and hopefully I'll get in soon. Mm -hmm. But you can kind of get this interactive tour. Um, the joke going around is it's, what is it? Well, it's just like Facebook, it's Facebook. but it's not Facebook. Because, you know, a lot of people don't like Facebook. So, so I I'm, I'm just throwing it out there. I'm just saying that it's there. Um, you probably can't get into it yet anyway, but it's something to keep an eye yes, on. I see lots of people saying, I want in, I want in, I yep. want in. I don't think I've seen anyone yet say, hey, I'm in. I'm in. I am in i know. does yeah. this. And that. But yeah, you're, like you said, it just came out yesterday. Now, there are a lot of articles out there of people who have gotten in, but I don't know anybody in the library world yeah, that's well, written you know, about it yet. Yeah, well, you know, the big people in the big, yeah, yeah. that review this yeah. kind of And they were all at ALA anyways. So, yeah. you know, maybe maybe they um, have invites and we just haven't gotten back to it. Question? Yeah, it's like... Um, um, or no? Um, uh, no, I'm asking you. Oh, me. Um... You said, um, like there was. I could have misinterpreted what you no, said. No, just my own comment. Yeah, okay. it's, it's Google trying to compete with Facebook, <laughs> pretty much. Yep. Um, we'll see what happens. Naming everything, their own stuff. I read about the circles and the hangouts and sparks. They gave new names to stuff that we've already been doing. But, you know, mm -hmm. they made it their own. I, I, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Um, Google, so just, Google has a spotty record with social stuff. So, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see what happens. Yeah, they've tried lots of different things. And, you know, it's great that they try these things. Yep. Uh, we do have just a comment from someone on the session here um, that's... Oh, a link to some article somewhere where someone said, first take Google Plus gets features right but offers no reason to leave Facebook. That's the title of yeah, this link sure. that she sent to. Mm -hmm. um, it talks about the features that are in it. Um, yeah. Well, I'll sign yeah, up we'll just to for that, sign yeah. up. I mean, you know, establish your presence. Sure. And, and just to see, see what, what happens. Yeah. Um, I did see one person somewhere in line say, can't wait for it. I want to get into it. I can't wait to get off Facebook. Okay. It will only be useful if everybody gets everyone off Facebook. Everyone yeah, gets I know. It's, to it, it's, though. So you just got to see if it comes uh -huh. out that it's something that beats Facebook. Yeah. Yep. So Brand new, though. There you go. So we'll see what happens. All right, speaking of Facebook, this is kind of cool. Um, Aaron on his Walking Piper blog pointed me to this, and I'll show it to you, but the problem is this is pretty much all in either Portuguese or Spanish. I'm not sure which, because it's done by the a public library network in Medellin. I cannot really say that uh, very well, but it's called Fantastic Book, and I just I think somebody should do this in English. It's, it's a pretend social networking site uh, for kids to learn about literary characters. So Dracula has a page, uh, was, was the example that he provided here. And um, it does take a bit to load up. Uh, it's it's, it's flash-based, I think. Uh, so we're loading up here. And again, I can only go so far because I, I have enough trouble with English. Um, but so you can go in here and so you have uh, Dracula and Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn and Alice and Pinocchio. Uh, let's let's pull up Tom uh, yeah, Tom Sawyer here and that will load up his page. And the idea is to kind of use this interface and they talk to each other too. See they're leaving uh, messages there. Little Ed Lighting Hood is uh, asking uh, Tom Sawyer some questions here. Oh wow. Um, and he has some friends including Becky Thatcher and Huckleberry Finn. Of course. Of course. And Sid. I don't know who Sid is. Um, but it's 332 amigos. 
<laughs> and the idea is to kind of use the, the Facebook-like interface to teach kids about characters and literature. And I, it, it, just fun. it was fun That's looking around creative. in this, even though yeah, I didn't really I like understand it. most of what was being said. Yeah. I was just really impressed. And I, and I think uh, uh, creating this in other languages, I think, would be uh -huh. a really, really great idea uh, to play around with. And, you know, done by a library. So there you go. All right, I am running out of time, so let me see a few more things it's to, like to talk after about here. Started, yes. started at five after. Oh well, okay, we got a little more time. Um, okay, ten minutes. A um, little bit back to copyright, but uh, this happened about a month or so ago. Um, YouTube now allows for really? Creative Commons licensing of contents, and this is where Firefox come up. Um, it doesn't allow a lot of options, though, is, is kind of my response. People know me know I'm very big on the Creative Commons. It, yeah. Um, you I basically, was looking for choose which Creative Commons license I want, and it doesn't. It doesn't. It you offers one. you traditional copyright or attribution um, um, share alike, I think. It doesn't allow you to narrow down to just non-commercial uses. I think it's either, you know, Creative Commons has several different licenses mm -hmm. to pick from. YouTube is allowing for traditional copyright or one particular license. Mm -hmm. Oh, the CC by 3.0. Okay, so that would be attribution. So you could not prevent commercial use. Mm -hmm. You either have to have full traditional copyright or Creative Commons attribution only. I would argue step in the right direction, oh, but explain there that YouTube reps told me over the phone earlier today only one will be available but thinking they said is to start simple um, uh, and then multiple license classes might be overwhelmingly complex, really complex for casual users. Flickr has been doing it for years. Yeah well. So it's news it's a start. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of I was happy and then quickly underwhelmed. Yes. By was, uh, exactly, the lack of yes. options. I was like, awesome, let me go so, make my choice. Oh, there isn't yeah. really a choice. Yeah. But like it says, this it says it's, it's a, a step in the right direction. Um, I think they'll get a lot of comments like this. Like said, Flickr has been doing it for years. Creative Commons is new to a lot of people, but yeah. it's not to a lot of casual users. It's been around for over a decade um, at this point. I think so they'll get a lot of backlash, but in a good way, saying, just give us all the options. We're not dumb. Right. We're so. capable of reading and, and figuring it out. Mm -hmm. Okay. We've done it elsewhere. Okay, Christy, you want to wrap up by talking about Facebook? What? Facebook had another kerfuffle. Oh, geez, yeah. Okay. Facebook had a kerfuffle <laughs> earlier in the month about yes. facial recognition. Yes. Okay. Now, what I will do is I, I will bring up this article and I will give you the, the general take that I've been reading and then you can talk me off a ledge. Is that so? <laughs> okay. 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 <laughs> I upload pictures to Facebook, mm -hmm. okay, and Facebook has turned on facial recognition so that automatically any picture I upload of myself or of my friends, mm -hmm. okay, they will automatically be tagged so that, you know, if I upload a picture of you, everybody's going to automatically know that it is you, mm -hmm. and you know what, I don't want that, so I need to turn this feature off. You're wrong. Okay. How am I wrong? <laughs> Talk me off the ledge. Because of, it's one short thing. It's not automatic. Okay. All right. Fair um, enough. It is. It suggests who is in this photo that you have uploaded to you as the person uploading it. Okay. And says, hey, you've already tagged pictures that look, we can see facial recognition. You've already got pictures in your Facebook photos. And this person looks like that same person. Okay. Would you like to tag it with that person's name? Are okay. Correct. And you then, as the person uploading it, have to actively say yes and tag it. Okay. So there is no automatic tagging. There's automatic okay. recognition and suggesting to you as the uploader of the picture to tag it. Okay. Which you so, have had to actively tag in the first place anyway. So oh, in previously, the, let, anyway. let's say a year ago, I was at one of your parties. Yeah. And I took some pictures and I uploaded those pictures and I said, in this picture, that's Krista. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now it's today and I upload another photo that has you in it. Mm -hmm. What you're telling me is Facebook will say, hey, I think that's Krista. Would you like to tag 
this person as Krista. This new picture. With right, with, on the new picture. Okay. Yes, exactly. So it's not automatic. It's nope. providing me with a suggestion. Yes. Okay, so what is there to turn off? There is a feature in Facebook that they added that you can go into your profile, and I, this video, and I'm sure this blog mm -hmm. post here explains it, where you can prevent anyone, your friends, whoever, from tagging you in pictures. I believe is what it is. Okay, so, um, so if you turn it off, yes, Facebook will not suggest you to me on my photos. Yes. Okay, but I could still manually say that's Krista. Yes. Unless you prevent people from tagging you at all. I'm not sure if it has that feature. Honestly. Okay. Honestly, I'm not sure. Okay. So but I'm, you can so, also, so, whenever you are tagged in a photo, also mm -hmm. you are notified by Facebook saying right. you've been you can, tagged in this, and then you can go there and untag yourself. Okay. I have had many people do that in photos I've put up. Sure. That they just oh, they think they don't look good in the picture. <laughs> Sometimes I can tell. Sometimes that's it. Uh, or sometimes there are just, certain people are just like, no, I do not right, want okay. my face so, associated with me. So they untag themselves. So you, anytime something is tagged, you'll always be given told by Facebook notified, you've been right. tagged. And then you, when you go to that picture, look at it. You as the person who's been tagged, there will be a little op uh, thing that says untag me okay. or untag. So so um, if I turn off and, and I see there's a suggest tags. Yes. If I turn off suggest tags, that doesn't mean that suggestions won't be given to me. It's that I won't be suggested to other people. Is, is that my understanding? So if you yes. try to, yeah, okay, yeah. Wow, that's subtle. Yes, that <laughs> you will still be told that you can tag people, but right. other people will not be told that they can tag you. Right, okay. Yes. So not necessarily a big monster kerfuffle. No, it's just um, making what it's, it's was, making image tagging a little easier. Mm -hmm. And okay. when it first was announced, made Public. wide open to everyone, um, posts were put up by I think it was Lifehacker, or maybe in somewhere else I saw a page. I think it was where it said the the titles of articles were incorrect. Okay. They actually said, and they went back and changed some of these articles once people actually read the info and replied back to these websites saying, it doesn't do anything automatically. Why are you trying to scare people? The titles of people panicked and said, okay. oh my God, Facebook is automatically tagging your pictures. End of the world. Privacy is gone. And then when people <laughs> actually read the information from Facebook and realized, I'm confused. It doesn't mm -hmm. say it automatically does anything. It suggests to your friends and then they have to actually do something actively. Why are you, people, you know, people, and then they went back and changed, like I said. Okay. Um, there are still, you know, people still are going to say, I don't like facial recognition because it's bad and privacy invasion. Anyways, sure, okay, that's your, mm -hmm. um, you can say that, you can have that opinion, and feel free to go into your Facebook and follow these instructions and turn off anyone's ability, turn off the Facebook ability to suggest you to your friends. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. yeah, I mean, when, once you once we, we, we've already had this conversation. Um, <laughs> once once Krista kind of explained it to me. I mean, some people accuse me of being a little obnoxious when it comes to privacy issues online. Yeah. I'm not concerned about this one. I, people have I mean, it's, it. it's the, the thing. Another you know, thing too was uh, some articles came out. I know it's something else I was trying to remember to say. Um, the oh my gosh, Facebook has um, snuck up and threw something at us again without telling us. How evil of them! Um, no, this was um, first enabled actually last December, and it was actually announced to the world last December that they were rolling this out as December 2010 as a test thing, and some people were going, what is this? Actually? Just, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was going to show one more thing okay. before we wrapped up. So, so, so that was another thing you may have seen stuff people saying Facebook evil again, suddenly throwing this thing at us without even telling us and enabling it. They're horrible. No, they announced it last December. Um, you can find the articles from back then and the announcements then that it was actually being rolled out as a test thing to some people, um, and we're going to see how it goes. And then it was just was it last month? I don't know. We yeah, don't know it was. It was end of end of months. May, beginning yeah, of June. That they then put out a new um, announcement of we are now, now that we've had this test phase from December till now, we are now rolling it out to everyone mm -hmm. to have and use. So lots of mis misconceptions and panicking without reading the actual info, which I think 
kind of speaks to a lot of things that happen on the internet, I would mm -hmm. say, or in the technology world or in the Facebook world. I've been caught up in People it. People panic when they first read something and don't look into it fully. Don't panic about these things right off the bat. Read anything like this that comes up that you're concerned about. Research it, find out about it. We're librarians. We do this anyway. So for us, this is a no-brainer to research it mm -hmm. and really figure out what are they really doing? Help your patrons by doing that for them and calm them down when they come in and panic and say the evil end of the world has come because of this. Yes. <laughs> Speaking of the end of the world and the end of productivity, um, <laughs> boy, boy, you segued that beautifully. We did not play. Um, you can now play Angry Birds in your browser. <laughs> Chrome.angrybirds.com. It does actually work in multiple browsers, not just Chrome. Uh, I'm playing, I'm bringing it up right here in Firefox. Um, yeah. Oh, there we go. It is loud. So I'm not going to actually play. I'm going to close that now. <laughs> I'm sure the recording just picked that up. That's but yes, so as the end of all productivity. Now uh, that one, feel free to panic about. I guess. <laughs> That one is totally acceptable. Um, and that's not even in my bookmarks list. Go find it on your own. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, there are You're not going to be an enabler. No. Well, I just kind of was. Okay. <laughs> um, there's a few other things in here you might want to take a look at. Um, I did. I, I always have more than I could possibly fill in time. Uh, but um, I, I got to, the, I think, the things that were really important that I wanted to make sure everybody heard about uh, during this session. So that's uh, that's me. That's my that's yes. my shtick. For All this month. of um, the links that are listed here, even the ones that did not get to talk about today, will be in links to from the recording. Yep. We put that up, mm -hmm. so even the stuff we didn't get to, you will be able to get to them and um, read up on it yourself. Um, does anybody have any final questions, comments, or anything um, before we do um, wrap up? I do. We have a new website. Oh, hey, yeah, well, we should. Talk about <laughs> <laughs> um, I just. Go look. Um, the new website is up. It is live. Um, the blog is there. New menus, new reminders, new pictures of the libraries off to the side. Um, uh, enhanced search functionality. A brand new calendar that puts everything in one place instead of two different calendars. A lot of work has gone into this. And uh, just in case you hadn't heard yet, here's your chance. Go check out the new website, nlc.nebraska.gov. It's is also a new, a new URL. Yep, it's also a new URL. Um, check it out. If you go to the old URL, I'm sure you will be sent to the new one. Yes. But um, kind of go ahead well, and do there. Menus yep. for all these things. Um, rearranged by um, Topic. topics mm -hmm. of the things we do. Hopefully more helpful to find things. So there you go. Um, we do have a All comment right. from someone in the audience saying thanks so much to us. It was nice to know a few things I was not aware of, like this, should I change my password? Uh, you know, yeah. now's a good chance that if you haven't changed your password, change it anyway. And you want to bring up Encompass Live yes, while we're, while while we're here, there? I'm oh, whoop, that's Encompass. Oh, whoops. Sorry. See, we're still learning the new website. Encompass. Encompass. Right yes. Next to there you yes. go. <laughs> All right. Okay, now I'm done. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending this week. Um, lots of very good information crammed into there. Glad yeah. to have it. Um, and our Encompass Live page is still there. Um, you can always get to it. Um, hope you'll join us next week when we have a session on the best of ALA 2011. ALA is just wrapping has just wrapped up in New Orleans, and we have a bunch of librarians, people from here in Nebraska who attended. I'm sure some of you may have. And we're going to have a group of them um, coming here and sharing their experiences. Um, I've got, sorry, some people, I don't have the names up here yet because I'm just getting people confirmed today. As people get back today, people were traveling yesterday. Um, Amy Mather from Omaha Public Library, Jessica Chamberlain, who's our Northeast um, Library System System Administrator, Robin Bernstein from Bellevue, Bellevue University, um, Mary Jo Ryan and Rod Wagner from here at the Library Commission. So far, all those people will be here chatting with us about what they saw at ALA this year. So we'll have a nice cool. little discussion about that. And if you attended, um, please feel free to show up. And if you had anything cool you want to share with us, we want to hear it as well. So mm -hmm. um, come, to, come to our Encompass Live next week for the ALA and find out what people saw and share what you did there if you were there. So it doesn't look like anything new has come in while I've been babbling away here. So thank you very much for attending. Thank you, Michael, for oh, all the information. And we will um, see you next week. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye.